Well, you've joined us on a special weekend, and for those of you who are watching our live stream, uh, we know from last week you're all around the country and even around the world. Welcome. And uh, to those of you who are here in person, welcome. Hey, you've joined us for a unique week. This is just a really a one-time message today called Hope of Nations, and it correlates with a book that released last week. This is a book I had finished right when I moved here, and the publisher had it scheduled for June. It's a unique book. Those of you who know me know I have a very nerdy half of myself. I used to be a journalist, an investigative reporter. And that's what the first half of this book does. It looks at culture in the United States and even globally to kind of chart out a trajectory of the next 30 years and really answer the question, what kind of world are our kids and grandkids going to inherit? Uh, so the book studies things like Islam, which is by far the fastest growing ideology in the world. It studies things like the rapid rise of China, which will displace the United States to become the number one economy in the next 10 years or so. And within the United States, the book looks at a lot of the social tensions that we're seeing right now. So I won't nerd out today, or I'll try not to. I'll try not to bore you guys with that stuff. But the real heart of the book is to answer this question, how do we live for Christ in a changing world. Once we understand the world we live in, how do we best represent Christ in this world? And I want to start answering that question by telling you a true story from my college years. I had a huge crush on this girl named Kelly. Now, if you've met my wife, Melanie, you might say, John, why would you ever have dated anyone else? And you'd be right, Mel's amazing. And actually, since I've met Mel, I haven't dated anyone else. But this was before I knew Mel. And I was a college kid, and I was working at a camp in Arizona, and there was this girl, Kelly. I had the biggest crush on her. And it was a Friday night. The one camp had left. Another group of campers would show up on Monday. And so I was taking Kelly out on a date. And I put on my nicest clothes, and I borrowed a vehicle from a friend, this white Jeep Cherokee. And Kelly and I, we were going to go play putt-putt golf, and then we were going to watch a movie. And I was just so excited. I liked her so much. So we're driving... And Kelly's in the passenger seat. I'm behind the steering wheel. And I look, and up ahead on the road, I see a, a bicycle laying on the side of the road. At first, it seems kind of weird. And then I notice that there's a guy laying on the road. So I hit the brakes. I start pulling over. And as I'm pulling over, in the headlights, I see that this guy is laying in a pool of blood. I jump out of the car. And by the time I get to him, I can see that his flannel shirt that he's wearing is just saturated in blood it's like shining and what had happened someone had hit him and they kept going it was a hit and run and he'd flown off his bike and he landed on that metal guardrail on the side of the road he landed right in his armpit on that and it had cut the inside of his arm well I had just taken lifeguard training and I knew these three main arteries of the body I think this one's called the brachial and that if someone's bleeding from one of those they can literally bleed to death. So it was one of those moments where my adrenaline took over. And the next thing I know, I've got this guy, I don't even remember if it was my belt or his belt, but I have his arm in a tourniquet to slow down the bleeding. I yell back to my friend Kelly to call 911. And it was one of those moments I'll never forget because it felt like an eternity. It was probably three or four minutes, but it felt like hours were going by as I'm standing there holding the pressure on the arm of this guy I don't even know. I'm wondering, is he going to live? Is he going to die? And I'm feeling just completely inadequate and unqualified to be handling the situation. Well, eventually the ambulance did show up and the guy went to the hospital and he ended up living. But I want to take you into that moment emotionally because I think if we're honest, when we look at the world around us, there's times where we see that it's not headed in the right direction and we feel completely inadequate to help. Uh, we see things like uh, suicide rates. We see things like just division among our neighbors. We see school shootings. We are seeing all these things globally and locally that are unsettling. And we think, you know, what can I even do to help a hurting world? This last week has been one of those weeks where we've seen a lot of our neighbors get into fights about how to handle social and moral change in the United States. It's been one of those weeks where we're reminded that many, many people have such little hope in life. They've become so hopeless that they're taking their lives. In fact, the Center for Disease Control reported this last week that suicides in the United States 
have risen 30% in the last 10 years. In fact, right now, the number 10, the 10th leading cause of death in America is suicide. And almost to demonstrate the point, we saw two tragic high-profile suicides. Kate Spade, the designer of handbags and a clothing designer, incredibly wealthy, incredibly successful, incredibly loved, and she took her own life this last week. Just a couple days after Kate Spade took her life, another well-known celebrity TV chef and travel and food host Anthony Bourdain also took his life. I was actually reading one of those stories, and as I was reading it, my Pandora music station was playing, and a song came on by this guy named Avicii. Avicii was 28 years old, and he took his life just a few weeks ago. He'd made $85 million, world famous, and took his life. We live in a world of people who are desperately searching for hope. Why is it that the world we live in is so broken? With all of our advances in science and in technology and in medicine, why is it that the world we live in is so broken? And the answer is very simple. It's that people everywhere desperately need Jesus. As followers of Christ, we have experienced in our lives that there's a part of the human soul that only God can fix. And every other pleasure in life, every other success Every other thing that people try to use to fix the human heart is just like putting a band-aid on a life or death mortal wound. What we need is to be reconnected with God, and we've experienced that. But sometimes we forget that this is what our neighbors need. And sometimes the people who desperately need Jesus, the things that they're looking to to fulfill them or satisfy them can be disturbing. And sometimes we've got to decide as Christians are we going to drive past the people in the world who are bleeding on the side of the road? Or are we going to pull the car over, get a little bit uncomfortable, ruin our date night, maybe ruin our nice clothes to connect someone back to Jesus who desperately needs him? Just like that man who was lying on the side of the road, so many souls around us are bleeding to death on the road of life. They're empty because they don't have Jesus. Sometimes they're self-destructive because they don't have Jesus. Sometimes they lash out as us, as if we're their enemies, because they're in such a painful place. I believe you're here today because you want to help the world. I believe you're here today because you want to help your neighbors. I believe you're here because you care. And I believe as followers of Christ, we're here because God has placed us at this time in history to be his messengers of good news. So how do we deliver God's solution to a world that isn't listening? How do we deliver this good news about Jesus to people who don't want to hear about Jesus? Or we could ask the question this way, how do we represent Christ in a culture that's running away from Christianity? How do we be good messengers of Jesus in a culture that is intentionally running away from Jesus. A culture where assumptions have changed, where values have changed, where the very fabric of society morally and culturally has torn and is being rewoven into something different. How do we represent Christ now? Anyone else want to know the answer to that question? I sure do. So let's look into the Word of God, and God answers this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's what God says directly from his heart and directly to us as followers of Christ or Christians. We're told this in verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 5. God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. What does that mean? Well, that word reconciled more or less means reconnected. In other words, as followers of Christ who believe the Bible, we know that all humans are born separated from God. The Word of God says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What that means is that humanity as we know it is not how God originally designed it. There's an adversary, a deceiver named Satan or the devil who came into this world to kill and steal and destroy. And when he did, he separated humanity from God. And there's this chasm between us and God. And this is why there's pain in the world. This is why there's death in the world. This is why there's sickness in the world. Because of sin. Because of evil. But God who loves us stepped down into this world in the person of Jesus to make a bridge 
back across that divide so that anyone who believes in him can be reconnected or reconciled back to God. And so what this passage says is we've been reconciled or reconnected to God through Christ. That's true for us as Christians. But the world out there who doesn't believe in Christ yet, they haven't yet been connected to God through Christ. So they don't have his peace in this life. And they don't have the assurance of eternal life. And what this verse says in the second half is that now God has given to us this message or this ministry of reconnecting people back to God, of reconciliation. That's our job on earth is to share this good news that people can be reconnected to God. Verse 19 puts it this way, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he was providing the bridge to connect humanity back to God. No longer counting people's sins against them. That's what happens the moment you place your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Scripture describes that your sins are then washed away. And you're reconnected to God. You're adopted into the family of God. And you now live a life where you know that you're going to be with God for eternity. And you also have freedom from sin possible in this life. And God has committed to us this message of reconciliation or of reconnecting to God. So what does all this mean? Verse 20 tells us, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Now the word ambassador, what's an ambassador? An ambassador is when you have two different civilizations, two different countries, and they have different cultures, they have different values, they probably even have different languages. And because these cultures don't want to get into a war or because they want to trade with each other, one culture sends an emissary or a diplomat, a representative to the other country so that the two countries can dialogue and hopefully be reconciled or connected. And what God says here in our passage today is that we, followers of Christ, you know, God could have, the moment we were saved, the moment we placed our faith in him, he could have teleported us to heaven. Why didn't he do that? The reason is that there's work for us to do in this world. And that work is being the emissaries from heaven, the diplomats, the ambassadors. And so it's as if God was making his appeal to humanity through us. So the people in our world who are bleeding to death on the side of the road of life, those who are drowning in addiction, drowning in depression, those who are trying every kind of identity, every kind of relationship, every kind of pleasure to find that missing piece and none of it's working. What's the solution for them? Who's going to tell them that God loves them? According to this passage, this message has been entrusted to one group and that group is us. As followers of Christ, we are Christ's ambassadors. So you could summarize the passage this way. God has entrusted to us his global message of reconciliation he's entrusted it to us you know as i've studied this passage this week i've realized that as a christian if you call yourself a follower of christ if you've placed your faith in him you don't get to choose if you're going to be god's ambassador to the people in your life or not you are his ambassador you don't get to choose the question is are you being a good ambassador or are you being a lazy and indifferent ambassador? That's the question I've been asking myself. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look into God's word to see how can we be good ambassadors to the people around us. Well, as I mentioned, uh, in this book, I study the culture. Because if you're going to be an ambassador, you will study the culture of the people that you go to so you can understand them and without nerding out and giving you all kinds of charts and graphs which i i wanted to do <laughs> but i will spare you guys all those charts and graphs about global trends and trends within the united states they all come down to nine specific trends the first trend is that the world we're going to live in is a post-truth world oxford dictionaries every year picks a word of the year and in 2016, they picked the word post-truth to define American and European culture. And the definition of post-truth is that Americans and Europeans now define truth by their feelings rather than by facts or by what's written down. 
So we live in a world where there's still some truth-based thinkers, typically baby boomers and above and Midwesterners, who define truth by what's written down. But there's a bunch of other people in American society who define truth really by how they feel or by what their peers say and do. And so that's one of the conflicts, one of nine conflicts that we're seeing in our lives. Now, because I'm not going to go deep into the research today, I want to show you just a little bit of God's uh, solutions from his word to these. So if you pull out in your notes this card, and if you're watching online, we'll have this uh, beneath the message. You can click on this and download this. These are nine solutions. These all come from scripture about how do we respond to these trends that we will see reshape culture. We are seeing these trends reshape culture around us. And the first way we'll respond is that we will remain rooted to the Christian scriptures. This is for us as followers of Christ. Now, we don't expect our non-Christian neighbors to uh, follow the scriptures because they're not Christians. But for we who are Christians, we know that the word of God leads to life and to freedom. Jesus said once that whoever's on my side is on the side of truth. Jesus says in John chapter 14 that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So we can't believe in Jesus without believing that he is the truth standard. And the truth standard he refers to is the scriptures. And so as Christians, in a world where truth is feeling-based, we will remain rooted to the scriptures and their life-giving direction. And so when an issue arises and we think, how do we respond to that? We'll always look to the word of God to see what it says. Now the real challenge is when it says, love your enemies, are we going to do what it says? When it says, pray for those who persecute you, are we going to do what it says? And today, I'm going to challenge us toward that. Let's look at the second of these nine ways we'll respond. We'll train our young. Uh, in a society of educated ignorance, we will train our young people in the freedom, knowledge, and power of the Christian truth. So as parents and grandparents, we're going to be intentional about the ideas that are going into our young people's minds, knowing that the war against Satan is a war in the realm of ideas and information. Satan is a deceiver. Number three, we'll be known for doing good. Uh, each of these, by the way, is a chapter in the book, Hope of Nations. And this chapter is based on a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, where God says to Christians living in a pagan and hypersexual society, God says, live such good lives among the pagans. Be living right among those non-Christians. Live such good lives among the pagans that even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your good deeds and glorify God. And so how will we live? Well, in a world where Christians are labeled as bigots or backwards, I don't know if you've experienced that yet. I definitely have experienced that when I worked in the mainstream media and when I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. There were times where I'd meet people and as soon as they found out I was a Christian, they just assumed that I was bigoted and backwards. And if we're not prepared to live in that kind of world, we can get really defensive and we push back on the people. It's like, no, I'm not a bigot. <laughs> and then we almost prove their point by our response. But if we know, okay, these are trends in society. There's going to be people who when they see that I have a Bible, they think I'm bigoted. If I'm prepared for that, I know from the Bible how to respond to that. And according to 1 Peter 2, it's to live a good life among those people. So I'm not going to get riled up if they call me a name or if they accuse me something. I'm actually going to be known for doing good and for serving those people. All of our responses are based on the word of God. How does he tell us to respond to such a culture? Number four, we will dignify all people as image bearers of God. In a world where people are treated as commodities or as opponents, we will dignify all people as image bearers of God. Even people who are sinners, even people who are far from God, all of us, the fall of sin when we were separated from God, it marred us. But every human being is still made in the image of God, is eternally valuable to God. So we will dignify all people, including those who hate us, those who call us names. We're going to dignify all people. And unfortunately, we're probably going to see in our lifetimes the value of human life continue to decrease. Uh, humans are increasingly treated as opponents or they're treated as commodities. That is, society looks at a person and says, how do we get money or how do we get value out of that person rather than giving dignity to that person? But as followers of Christ, we will continue to dignify all people. Number five, and this is the one we'll unpack today, we will be ambassadors 
in a post-Christian world. What does that mean? Does post-Christian, post means after. Does that mean there's no Christians in the world? Well, obviously not, because here we are and we're all Christians, or at least most of us in this room, okay? In a post-Christian world, we will be ambassadors to foreign tribes. What post-Christian means is that we're in a society that was centered around many Christian values and beliefs. Now, I'm not saying it was a Christian nation. It wasn't formally a Christian nation. But if you look at Gallup data, as recently as the 1940s, after World War II, 94% of Americans identified as Christian. And if you go from World War II all the way back to 1776, that's how it was. The majority of Americans identified as either Catholic or Protestant. And so it was a country where on Sunday... All the businesses shut down, and a lot of them still do, or at least you don't have to work on Sunday. I always tell my non-Christian friends, even if you don't believe in Jesus, you can thank him that you get Sundays off, okay? That's a uniquely Christian thing that came from the Christians. And so whether, we like, whether you like Christianity or not, whether you've been taught this or not, you can dig into history and see for yourself this was a largely Christianized society. And what I mean by that is the majority of people did go to church and they at least had a positive view of the bible and the idea of god and the church that has rapidly changed in the last 50 years and it's now a post-christian world in other words the leading edges of society like mainstream media higher education especially the leading ivy league universities the coastal metropolises like la and new york and san francisco that tend to set the tone for the nation are all post-christian And so in a post-Christian, they've moved beyond Christianity and that kind of culture, we're going to be ambassadors to foreign tribes. In other words, we're going to understand that some of our neighbors, they might live across the street from us, but the way they think and view the world is foreign. They have a different different view of reality, and so we're going to kind of learn their language. We're going to behave diplomatically to neighbors who've been told the worst about Christianity. So I experienced this in the news media. I remember, uh, because I was raised in the Midwest, I remember the first time I met a blue blood person who'd grown up on the coast in a very elite, Ivy educated uh, environment. And both of her parents were Ivy League university professors. Both her parents were atheists. She had never met a normal Christian. Because of where she grew up in the United States, she'd never met a normal Christian. When she found out that I was a Christian, she thought I was like some kind of like snake handler, (laughs) cultish. Um, You know, in her mind, Christians were people who bomb abortion clinics and they're like these weirdo cult people. And uh, as I worked in the news media, I realized many of my peers in that industry had never met a normal Christian like me before and when I started to build relationships with them to show them who Christ was I realized you know when we send missionaries to a tribe in Africa that's never heard of Jesus before we're starting at zero they've never heard of Christianity but with a lot of our American neighbors who are post-Christian we're not starting at zero we're starting in the negative They've been told that Christians are the ones who have done all the evil in history. They've been told all sorts of things that are very one-sided. And I I have lots of friends, they're graduates of Harvard, and they don't know that Harvard was started by the Reverend John Harvard, and that it was started by Christians, or that Yale and Princeton were also started by Christians. There's a lot of what is true in U.S. history that is, is getting buried, and people are being told just the worst of Christianity. And so when some of those people who've grown up in those settings interact with us they bring assumptions to the table that we have to be aware of if we're going to be good diplomats to them so let's look back at our theme verse second corinthians 5 verse 20 we are therefore christ's ambassadors as though god was making his appeal through us so as the world around us continues to change as the culture changes right underneath our feet we're going to find ourselves in tense situations sometimes in social conflicts where our human emotion would be to get defensive and say, that's uncomfortable, I don't want to go there, I'm going to back away. But if we're true to the word of God, then we have to say, okay, God has placed me in this situation. And by the power of God's spirit within me, I'm going to claim the promises of God's truth that I've been appointed to be an ambassador in this situation. And so I might feel unqualified, but I know God has qualified me. I'm actually going to move toward that person that scares me. Because my mission in life is to connect them back to God as 
an ambassador. Let me give you a, a little illustration of this or a, a way that might help make this practical. I want you to imagine that when you leave here today, you get a phone call. And uh, you look down on your phone, it just says like 0000. zero, zero, zero. That's weird. So you pick it up. And it's the Secretary of State from the United States. And the Secretary of State says, uh, we've chosen you. We would like to appoint you to be the ambassador from the United States to India. Okay, so you say you're going to think about it. You start to do some research. And let me tell you why I would say yes, okay? I've been to Washington, D.C. enough to see that ambassadors, they get these little sky blue, pale blue license plates. It's called a diplomatic license plate. And they cannot be pulled over for speeding. It's true. It's called diplomatic immunity. So you decide, okay, I will be the ambassador to India if only for the license plate, if only so I can speed. So you agree, the license plates show up in the mail, you put them on your car, you start speeding around town, and you start to think, you know, if I'm the ambassador to India, what kind of things should I do? Well, I would hope you'd at least Google, like, India, <laughs> right? If you understand you're the ambassador, you're sent from one country to the other, you're probably eventually, if you're taking your job seriously, you're going to actually go to that country. You're going to learn their customs, their values, their way of thinking. And when you show up in India as the ambassador, and they all look different, and they're all wearing kind of funny clothes, eating different food, have totally different values and traditions and assumptions, you're not going to be like, hey, why are you guys doing that? You're going to understand, well, this is Indian culture, this is what they do, and I'm here as an ambassador from the United States. Does that make sense? So what God's word tells us is that as followers of Christ, the reason we're still on planet earth is that we are ambassadors sent from heaven. And that this world is not ultimately our home. So the United States is a very noble nation. I personally believe it's the greatest nation in human history. But here's the thing, whether it's 200 years from now or 2,000 years from now, a day is coming when the United States will not exist. But as followers of Christ, our highest citizenship is our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Hebrews chapter 11 says there's a kingdom that will never be shaken. And that's where our highest citizenship is. So as followers of Christ, if we're true to the word of God, we may love the country we live in, of course, but we understand that our highest priority is that we're diplomats sent here from heaven to give the message of reconciliation to people who are far from God. And so when those people act a little different, look a little different, we don't back away, we actually move toward it because we want to connect them to Jesus. And when people make us uncomfortable, we have a choice, just like I did in that white Jeep Cherokee with the cute girl next to me. I just wanted to go on a date and have a good time. I did not want to stand on the side of the road in a puddle of blood holding a belt on a guy who was bleeding to death who I didn't even know. That's not what I wanted to do, but it was obviously the right thing to do. And we have a choice in a culture that's rapidly changing with people who don't think like us, believe like us, to decide, are we going to lock our doors and put up our windows and go on in our comfortable little bubble of our comfortable little life, or are we going to acknowledge that God has called us to be ambassadors? And the people in our lives, whether it's a nephew or a neighbor or a child or a friend's child or a coworker or a student who believe very differently than us and might be from a totally different tribe, God has placed them into our lives for a reason so we can be an ambassador. I want to give you three uh, steps toward being successful ambassadors. And the first is to understand tribalism in a post-Christian United States. Tribalism. In other words, there used to be a kind of Central American way. There used to be some Central American values. For the most part, that day has gone and is quickly going away. And now, as we interact with our neighbors in America, they come from various thought tribes. So we are a tribe, the evangelical Christian tribe. There's the tribe of atheists. There's the tribe of agnostics. There's a Muslim tribe. There's a Hindu tribe. There's the LGBT tribe. There's all these different tribes around us. And anytime you have cross-cultural communication between tribes or nations, you inevitably have misunderstandings. You have suspicion you have conflict. And so if we understand that our neighbors, even though they might have Indiana driver's licenses, they're almost coming from different worlds in the way they think, then we can start to be ambassadors toward them instead of being defensive every time we have a disagreement with them. 
we're going to strive to resurrect the art of being diplomats and ambassadors. And I got to see this when I worked in the mainstream media. At one newspaper that I wrote for, all my coworkers were agnostic and atheist, and a whole lot of them were from the LGBT tribe. And many of them, when they first met me, they were very suspicious of me because they knew I was a Christian and they saw that I had a Bible on my desk. But over time, we got to know each other and I got to know them. And I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned and things from the Word of God about how to be a successful cross-cultural missionary. But right before we do, I want to ask you this question, personalize this. What foreign tribes has God strategically placed in your life? If you think through some of these tribes, the LGBT tribe, the Muslim tribe, the Hindu tribe, the atheist tribe, the agnostic tribe, some of these different non-Christian tribes, the people who sit across from you at Thanksgiving dinner and they don't see the world the way you do, or the person who's across the cubicle from you, or the person down the hall at your workplace or across the street in your neighborhood who sees the world from a completely different viewpoint, who are some of those people in your life. And I want to encourage you, if you're taking notes, to actually write down some of those names, or at least to visualize in your mind the faces of some of these people who are from different tribes, because you see, it's not an accident that they're in your life. God is sovereign, and God has placed you in their life so that you can be an ambassador to them. So let's consider now, how do we successfully cross the cultural barriers between us and the people God's put in our lives. And that's the second step to becoming good ambassadors is successful cross-cultural missions. Now, we in the American church, and I mean this in the big sense of the church in America, we're, we're pretty decent at cross-cultural ministry when we go to Africa or Guatemala or India or Papua New Guinea. We show up and we understand that people are going to think we're kind of funny and that we look funny, and we smell funny, and that we do things different, and we understand that. What we now, if we want to be good ambassadors for Christ in Indiana and in the United States, is to understand that we are doing cross-cultural ministry across our streets, and across our boardroom tables, and across our dining room tables. We're doing cross-cultural ministry. So how do we do that well? Let's take another scenario. Let's take another imaginary trip, okay? This time I want you to imagine, instead of being an ambassador to India, this time you get a clear call from God. God calls you to be a missionary to a foreign tribe in Africa. So uh, you do all the preparation and you fly to Africa and you, you ride in a Toyota Land Cruiser way through the jungle and you get back there and this tribe has never seen an American. They've never seen electricity. They've never heard about Jesus or even the idea of Christianity. They're still using Stone Age tools. You get to this tribe and you realize they're cannibalistic. They still eat people. You realize that they are polygamists. A lot of the guys in the tribe have like eight or ten wives. You see all these moral things that the Bible would say for Christians are wrong. Now, when you get to that tribe, how successful do you think you'll be as an ambassador? If the very first thing you say is, hey, uh, God sent me here. He's just. He's holy. You all are sinners. You've sinned in all these different ways, and it's wrong that you're doing this, and it's wrong that you're eating people. If you start off that way, uh, are they going to have you over for dinner? Or are they going to have you <laughs> for dinner? Right? So we get this. When we go to Africa, we get this. You don't start there. We get that in Africa. But somehow, when it's our person across the street or across the boardroom, or right here in Indiana, for some reason we start there. And, and it's because we used to live in a culture where a lot of our neighbors shared our American values, but that has rapidly changed in the last 30 years, and it's going to keep changing according to all the data that I looked at. So how do we be good ambassadors to foreign tribes? Well, let me give you a few steps. For step one, we expect pagans to be pagans, okay? <laughs> when you interact with a foreign tribe, that is any tribe that is not Christian, we don't expect them to live by Christian morals. Non-believers are going to act like non-believers. So we, we don't be surprised by that. Uh, secondly, when you go to a foreign tribe, you don't view them as the enemy. They might view us as the enemy or as dinner in the case of the story we looked at. But we don't view them as the enemy. 
Because we know God has sent us as an emissary to bring them good news to connect them back to God. Now here's the the most important thing about cross-cultural ministry. And it's this, we show God's love through undeniable good deeds. Not through our words, but through our deeds. Let me say it again. We show God's love through undeniable good deeds. So if you were at a cannibalistic tribe in Africa, before you talk about Jesus or God or sin or anything like that, you're going to find out what do they need. Chances are they're getting their water from the river and their water probably has diseases in it. And so if you dig them a well and all of a sudden they've got this well and they can pump and this clean water comes out, whoa, they get, you still look weird to them, you sound weird, your clothes are weird with your buttons and zippers and everything, but they're like, they know you're good because of your deeds. And that's what 1 Peter 2 says, live such good lives among the pagans that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your good deeds. That's what God says about how we be cross-cultural ambassadors. So if you go to a tribe in Africa, you might dig them a well or you might build them a medical clinic or you might bring them some modern tools that they don't have so that they see through your actions, that person's weird, I'm still suspicious, but that person keeps doing good things for us. And I got to see this with my coworkers at the newspaper that I wrote for where I was definitely the only Christian is, you know, I'd just bring them a cup of coffee or I'd go, you know, to dinner with them. And they thought, wow, we didn't think Christians went to dinner with, with gay people, you know, and just get to know them and show them God's love through actions. And, and this is one of the hardest things because um, in the American church, we tend to want to talk right away like here's all the but but building cross-cultural relationships it starts with actions and then the next step is listening we have to learn the language so when we go to a tribe in africa it's a literal new language but here's what i've learned in the united states we can be talking to other americans and all be speaking english but be speaking a slightly different language when it comes especially to some of these really high conflict issues Uh, So, for example, I've got a a friend back in the Bay Area. She's not a Christian. She's a lesbian. And as I built a relationship with her over uh, months to connect her back to God with the goal of being an ambassador and telling her about Jesus, the day came where we started to talk about what it means to her to be a lesbian. And based on these principles from God's word, I thought, I want to listen And I want to understand what does she think of, what is the words homosexuality, Bible, Jesus, God, gay, lesbian, what do those words mean to her? Because the word of God is unchanging, it's objective truth, but I need to connect this unchanging truth to a person in a post-truth culture. And so what does she mean by those words? So one day I asked her, I said, hey, uh, what does it mean to you that you're a lesbian? She said, John... Um, for me, being a lesbian is all about my community and my identity. She said, I was abused as a child. I was bullied all through school. And my whole life, I've never felt like I fit in anywhere. I've always felt like I've been rejected and abused. And I've found in the gay community a group of people who accept me as I am. And so for me, being a lesbian, the gay pride marches, I'm part of all of it is part of me finally finding a place where I'm accepted and I belong. And um, I looked her in the eyes and I said, you know, can I just, as a Christian, can I just apologize to you for something? She said, sure. And I said, you know, the way God designed the church, we were supposed to be that for you. You know, when you were hurting and when you felt like you didn't fit anywhere and when you felt like you weren't loved, that's what the church was supposed to do. And I just want to apologize to you that we weren't there for you in that way. And I said, now, you know, um, as we kept talking, I said, can I share with you what most Christians think of when they hear the word homosexual or lesbian? I said, you know, most Christians, because of, you know, their, our view of the world, a lot of Christians think of an actual physical, you know, sexual act. I said, you know, in your mind, how much of that has to do to you with being a lesbian? She said, oh, John, I haven't been sexually active in 15 years. She said, for me, it's just a group of people who actually love me. And, and so the, the point is, I took the time to just listen to her, 
And that gave me the opportunity to then say, do you know that God loves you? Do you know that God sent me into your life for a reason so you could hear about Jesus? And if you'll place your faith in Jesus, you can be reconnected to God. And then this is true for missionaries in Africa and it's true for us here. If someone chooses to place their faith in Christ, God says in scripture that at that moment their spiritual identity changes. God's word describes all humanity as slaves to sin. We're in chains to sin and our eyes are blinded and our minds are darkened. But the moment someone calls out to God in Christ, they place their faith in Christ, all that changes. The chains of sin are broken. They're adopted into the family of God. Their eyes are opened. Their mind is enlightened. And now a person who's a new young Christian, very tenderly, just like with an infant or a baby, we get to start feeding them the word of God and saying, here's what God's word says about your thoughts. Here's what God's word says about your identity. Here's what God's word says about your sexuality. And we can disciple that person into a new way of life. But until they trust in Christ, if we expect them to act like a Christian and they haven't placed their faith in Christ, they're going to be frustrated and we're going to be frustrated because, you see, God transforms us from the inside out. The big difference between the message of Christ and religion is religion is conformity, moral conformity on the outside. The message of Jesus is transformation from the inside. And so God doesn't send us into the culture for us to conform people to just look a certain good way on the outside. He sends us with a message that there's transformation available from the inside out. And so those of us who claim the word of God as our truth standard, sometimes we have to push ourselves to get more biblical about that. You see, if we could create a society where everyone was forced to wear a white shirt and a tie and be in a monogamous, faithful, heterosexual marriage and look perfectly moral on the outside, but they hadn't placed their faith in Christ, it wouldn't be success. God's, God's mission for us is not moral conformity on the outside, it's spiritual transformation on the inside. And so we go as ambassadors with that message. So let's go back to the tribe in Africa, okay? You show God's love through actions. You listen and you learn their language. And the whole point is you're building to this moment in the relationship where you say, like I did with my lesbian friend back in the Bay Area, you're building to this moment. And think of the people in your life, Muslim, Hindu, atheist, agnostic, whoever they are. You're building to this moment where you've learned how they think. And so you can say, hey, uh, can I tell you something that might sound funny? I believe that there's a God who made you, he loves you, and he sent me into your life because he wants to be in relationship with you. Would you want to hear about that? Now, if they say yes, then you start to tell them about Jesus. If they say no, okay. You know, you just keep getting them cups of coffee. You keep loving them and you keep praying for them, praying that their heart will change, praying that their heart will turn toward God. And you just, as the Holy Spirit leads you, you keep putting that gentle invitation out. Can I tell you about the God that I believe loves you? And eventually the day comes, Lord willing, where they say yes and you tell them about Jesus, and you pray that they'll place their faith in him. And that's the whole goal of the relationship, is to be an ambassador. If they place their faith in Christ, then as I described, you start to disciple them into the new way of life. If they don't place their faith in Christ, you keep loving them knowing they're still a pagan, and they're going to keep living like a pagan. And that's, that's what pagans do. Does that make sense? All right, so this is what the Word of God calls us to do, to be ambassadors in a foreign culture ambassadors in a foreign culture and by the way being an ambassador doesn't work well if you just try to do it on a social media thread you know if you're called to be the ambassador to india you can't just go onto a facebook thread about india and just start writing comments and consider yourself a good ambassador you actually have to go to india and so I've learned especially where these different tribes in American culture are bouncing up against each other and there's conflict, making comments on internet threads doesn't really help anything. Uh, the people who agree with you will tell you they agree with you. The people who don't agree with you will be alienated from you. I have yet to meet any person who has been swayed in their political beliefs or religious beliefs or anything else by a Facebook comment. I have yet to see it happen. So... So if we're going to be good ambassadors, we're going to be a little more intentional about actually sitting down with people at coffee shops and in living rooms and in our workplaces and in our schools to understand how they think. 
Why? The goal is not to capitulate to society. The goal is not to get everyone to like us. The goal is to connect people back to Jesus. The goal is to share the good news with them. As I uh, mentioned, there's a whole lot more about that in the book. I'm summarizing just a part of one chapter here. But let me give you the third trait of a successful ambassador, and it's this. Our aim is not external behavior modification, but internal heart transformation. This is the message of Christ, that he came to change us from the inside out. Verse 17 of our text in 2 Corinthians 5, talking to Christians, said, um, You are new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. It's because we placed our faith in Christ that we can say no to sin and we can say yes to righteousness. And until people place their faith in Christ, they don't even have that choice yet. So our goal is to get them to the foot of the cross. Our goal is to let them know there's a God who loves them. And you might remember from kindergarten, uh, the old, it was always my favorite day, show and tell, where you got to bring, bring in your hamster or your model car or whatever else, and you got to show and tell. And this is essentially what God has called us to do with foreign tribes. We show them God's love through our actions in such an undeniable way that even if they're suspicious of us, they just see through our actions, wow, that person must care about me. We show them God's love through actions, and then once we've built that credibility, we tell them the good news. God loves you. He died on the cross for your sins, and I believe he sent me into your life to reconnect you back to him. Is this making sense? All right, so let me give you um, a little summary to ask you, in your life, which of these steps would be most helpful for you to take Christ to a changing society? Is it demonstrating love through actions? Is it actually living life together with an unbeliever? Is it taking the time to learn their language and listen? Is it finally presenting the good news? Once you build that relationship of having the courage to say, hey, um, I know it might sound weird to you, but I believe there's a God. I believe Jesus is God. And I believe what you're really looking for in life is found in Christ. Some of you have done the first steps and it's time to have the courage to take that step. We live in a world of people who desperately need Jesus. And if we view them as a threat or as our enemies, we'll get really insecure and really defensive. But if we realize these are people who are bleeding to death on the road of life, and God has given us the choice to either lock our doors and roll up our windows and keep going, just like that Pharisee did in Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. He was on his way to church. He was in his Sunday best, and he saw a guy bleeding on the side of the road, so he just kept going. Our choice is to either do that or pull the car over and acknowledge that uncomfortable person in my family, that uncomfortable person in my workplace, in my neighborhood, that uncomfortable person in my school who's far from Christ, God has called me to be an ambassador to them. So I'm going to step out of my comfortable bubble and I'm going to start to reach out to them and show them God's love through actions. I'll just close with one idea. I was teaching this material out in the Bay Area of California and a pastor came up to me afterwards and he said, John, um, I did everything you said and I failed. I said, what do you mean? He said, I reached out to the gay rights leader in my community. I took him to lunch. I spent months building a relationship. I did all these nice things for him. I told him about Jesus and he still hates me. He calls me names. He will, you know, he will just curse me out to my face after everything I've done, so I failed. I looked him in the eyes. I said, you're not a fail. You're, you're a success. Because you see, we follow a God who came into our lives as an ambassador. And he came into a foreign world and he showed his love through undeniable good deeds and he learned our language. And how did people respond to him as a perfect ambassador? A mob jeered for him to be publicly tortured and crucified. And that was not a failure, that was a success. See, when you're an ambassador, the definition of success is not how the people respond. The definition of success is, did I do my job to deliver the news from my nation? And so our definition of success is God has sent us as kingdom citizens into this world to deliver his good news to people who are far from him. Even if they reject us, even if they hate us, if we can lay our heads on the pillow at night, if we can look back at the end of our lives and say, I did my best to love those people through actions. I didn't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. I showed them God's love through good deeds. I presented the good news. Whether or not they accept it, 
you're a success if you're faithful as an ambassador. Does that make sense? So where I'm proud of you guys is this is a church that does love people. And I just want to encourage us in a world that's changing to not get defensive and back away and start fights, but to instead be loving. Let's understand our non-Christian neighbors, they're going to act like non-Christians, and we're going to love them, and we're going to build relationships with them so that we can tell them about Jesus and because we believe God's word is the standard of truth. Can I pray that for us? Father, across this room, Lord, I see it in the eyes of my brothers and sisters, and I know for people who are watching right now on the live stream as well, that we're wrestling through situations in our lives. We want to follow you. We want to be ambassadors for you. But Lord, if we're honest, there's some situations where we just don't know how to do that. And so what we want to do is we want to claim the power of your Holy Spirit who lives in every follower of Christ. That just like you empowered Paul the Apostle and the church in Acts to be ambassadors to a foreign culture, you will empower us today. We can't do it in our strength, but we can do it in your strength. In Christ, we have everything necessary for life and for godliness. And Lord, we're not in this world at this moment by accident. You haven't placed us here to merely survive. You haven't placed us here to stockpile in our retirement accounts. You've placed us here to be ambassadors and diplomats because, Father, there are millions of people who are bleeding to death on the road of life. Father, we pray that you will give us your heart, that we will slow down, that we will look out the window, that we will step out of our comfort zone to move toward the people who are hurting. And, Lord, even when they accuse us, even when they're afraid of us, that we'll be gentle, that we'll show your love through good deeds, that we'll listen to them, that we'll hear where they're coming from, that we'll hear their language and their story, God, so that we can tell them the good news that you love them. Lord, you are using this church right now to reach thousands of people. And Lord, we know there's thousands more who don't yet know you. And in each of our lives today, you've placed a nephew, a niece, a coworker, a student, a neighbor, an old classmate, people who are in foreign tribes, people who don't identify as Christian, but Lord, they need you. They're hurting inside. We just pray, Lord, that you will equip us as a church, every one of us as individuals, to go with love toward those people. Lord, we're committed to your truth standard for our lives as Christians. And when your truth standard tells us to pray for those who persecute us, we will. When your truth standard tells us to love our enemies, we will. And because your truth standard says that we are your ambassadors to reconnect the world to you, God, we will do that. Make us good at it. Make us great at it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.